Oh, hi. I'm here to talk to you about Heart of Darkness a little bit. I'm Katherine D. Harris, and this is for English 101 Introduction to Literary Criticism. So when we start this class, I just tell you, get Heart of Darkness in this particular edition. We don't really have a lot of time to talk about why I picked Heart of Darkness and what in particular that you need to look for. There's so much out there right now about Heart of Darkness in terms of the videos and peer-reviewed articles and also cliff notes, and you know you're going to go look at them. So I've made a selection of some of them that I like and that I don't like. So so I'd like you just to watch all of them um, and, and use them at your leisure as well. But there's a few things I really want you to know about why I picked Heart of Darkness. It's not just to torture you. It's technically a novella. It's only about 100 pages long, but it's incredibly dense. And one of the things that I want you to do is get away from this idea of the tyranny of the plot which means don't let the plot dominate everything you say about this particular novel. One of the things that's really terrific about it, not, not in terms of the content, but the way that it is written, there's so much ambiguity in the text that it makes great fodder for doing 10 different critical lenses that we're going to do all semester long. Here's a couple of things to remember. So one of the things about literature with a big L and all the things that you're taught in all the classes that you take is this is what somebody says about what makes good literature. Literature should convey timeless truths, thus distracting the masses from their immediate commitments, nurturing in them a spirit of tolerance and generosity, and so ensuring the survival of private property. All right, that last section was really more about 19th and early 20th century, but if we really think about it, the representation of good literature is about these timeless truths. And that doesn't mean all Shakespeare all the time. Look at some of the literature that's being written right now and being produced right now. It's really important to our world and seeking out empathy and compassion for people who are different from us. So one of the things that I do in this class is ask you to question what are you being taught in other classes? What's the value of it? And how can you understand it through several different critical lenses? Heart of Darkness is going to allow us to do that. And we don't have to assess if Heart of Darkness is good literature right now. Let's have this conversation again at the end of the semester. So here's another quote for you. Literature would be at once solace and reaffirmation, a familiar ground on which Englishmen could regroup both to explore and to find some alternative to the nightmare of history. So let's take the English man out of it. And can we just say all people? So in that, Definitely go to as many events as you can with our Center for Literary Arts. Go listen to authors speak, read as much as possible. Now, let's take a look at how you can do those kinds of readings. So with Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, by the way, those quotes are from Terry Eagleton in his book uh, called um, Introduction to Literary Criticism. Yeah. So let's, let's think about Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. It was published in 1899 in a, what's called a serialized um, output, meaning that it was a few chapters at a time. And it was in this magazine called Blackwood's Magazine. It didn't really receive any great attention until 1902 when there was a review that was hailing Joseph Conrad as it. And something that might be little known or not make it into cliff notes that you look at, Joseph Conrad was Polish, but he wrote this completely in English, even in the drafts form. So that's going to come back to us when we talk about semiotics and translation. So one of the things about Heart of Darkness is that it allows for all of these kinds of close readings. So here's some of the things as you read that I would like you to look out for. Look out for imagery and symbolism. So there's a lot of imagery and symbolism of the cracked nut and what's inside of that nut. There's overwhelming numbers of metaphors about light and dark. Think about refra refracted light with fog and um, a screen or a veil coming down or moonlight or the sunshine that never touches people. Right? 
The other imagery and the metaphors that are really interesting with light and dark is that there's a reversal of meaning. Light and dark usually has a very typical or symbolic meaning. Light is often seen as knowledge and good, and dark is often articulated, all the way back to Milton, as something that's evil or uncivilized or savage. And you'll see that reversed back and forth even in the same paragraph in Heart of Darkness. Just pay attention. And look for things like the veils, the moon, the mist, the precipice, their adventures of danger. You also have water that's everywhere. And traditionally, um, the symbol of water is rebirth. But I want you to note, does, does our primary character, our protagonist, um, Marlowe, ever get in the water? Right. One of the other things that I want you to note is that there's an, a narrative distinction here. This novel is created in what's called a narrative frame. It's not told in real time. It's a retrospective narrative. It begins at the beginning with an anonymous narrator, and it's somebody who's from the company, and that anonymous narrator is taught, it's telling you what Marlowe, Charlie Marlowe, is saying. So we have to trust that chain of events. And you also notice, if you pay attention to the verb tense, that within the retelling of it, Charlie Marlowe sometimes uses present tense and sometimes uses past tense. So we have three levels of narration there. We have the, what we're going to call the master narrator. That's the person who's speaking in the first couple of pages and describing everything. And that master narrator interjects himself at points in the novel without anything, a signal phrase pointing, saying, this is the master narrator, so you have to watch out for that. The other two narrators are, number one, Charlie Marlowe as Buddha Marlowe, as he's described while he's sitting on the ship, the Nelly, at the very beginning of the novel. And that's in real time, Buddha Marlowe. We're going to use that to talk about the the temporal shift, that subject position of Marlowe. And then the third one is young Marlowe, and let's use that. Young Marlowe is the one that's present tense in the novel is happening to him. So three narrations, the master narrator, Buddha Marlowe, the old guy sitting on the Nelly, and then young Marlowe, the one who, who's experiencing everything in Africa. So let's put that into our parameters here. Some of the things I want you to watch out for, now we're going to call these themes. That means they're really broadly construed, and I just want you to think about them. When we talk about themes, we're not talking about a message. We're not talking about the one thing or the one way that something is known. These are just patterns or parallels that we see throughout the novel. We're not making any statements on them, just observations. So themes, deterioration of the white man's morale, the immorality of whites or Europeans in Africa, civilization and its construction, and its consequent destruction of other cultures. That's related to something we call imperialism. And we're going to get to that when we do post-colonial theory. So we also have themes of what is truth, which we're going to question throughout this entire novel. Political truth about races in the Congo, meaning individuals, peoples, communities. Psychological truth about Marlowe and humanity in general. Moral truths, the trade in ivory, what happens with that? Nature, pay attention to when jungle is used or forest is used. So nature and white man's deviation from it. Look, how, look at how binaries are construed, and binaries are things that are battling up against each other. Um, civilized versus uncivilized, and uncivilized might also be articulated as savage. And these are the kinds of things that we run into today. We have pitting up in modern culture, talking about people who are educated versus who are not educated. So think about binaries as they're conflicting, right? So psychologizing of things and themes in this novel to look out for, it's written like a dream meaning it's ambiguous and it's got these long sinuous paragraphs. There's one paragraph that goes over three pages. And that, remember, is an oral tale. So that's because Marlowe keeps telling on and on and on, and he doesn't interrupt himself. 
there's some moments in, in the novel where he suddenly is telling the tale and then you see all these dashes and you can talk about or think about that's a moment that he's breaking down in his oral narrative and that catapults him back to being Buddha Marlowe instead of being young Marlowe. Right? So watch for those typographical instances throughout the text itself because they're representations of Marlowe's psychology. There's also self-discovery, that self-knowledge, along with the supposed discovery of Africa. Pay attention to the map scene in the beginning where Marlowe says, ah, I'm, I'm an explorer because I saw a blank map in a window shop when I was a child. It's a problem with that, but we'll talk about it. Um, he learns something in the retelling that he doesn't learn before Buddha Marlowe does, and we don't know what that is just yet. What else do I have to tell you? I'm cheating, I'm looking at notes here. Right. One of the things that we see is we ask the question, can the narrator, Buddha Marlowe, confront himself as his younger self or in the retelling of the story? And one thing that we really, this is why we use this novel, Marlowe's use of language exposes the limitations of language itself we're going to find that the same word is used like something light or a symbol or a metaphor in the same paragraph but it's got different meanings every time and we're going to struggle out those meanings and try to figure out what they are based on the other words around them that's called semiotics so i bet you do that already too we also have the issue of the divided psyche of marlowe of everybody else and one of the things that I want you to remember is that this entire novel is from the perspective of Charlie Marlowe, who is an upper class person who got his aunt to buy him to be a captain of a ship to go up the Congo and explore. He's not a working class person. So keep that in mind as you go through. You get hints uh, at the beginning of the novel, so really pay attention to those because they temper the way that he sees everybody else. Or look at how he treats and sees and describes all the people and especially the women that he runs into. One other secret. Often the African woman who is seen with Kurtz, one of the other people in the novel, She's articulated as the African mistress. She's labeled that by other characters in the novel. However, there is no evidence that she ever had sex with or is the mistress or lover of this guy, Kurtz. However, because one guy says it, everybody else then refers to it. Let's ask that question, what's missing here? And do we just go along with that as readers and make the same assumption or can we question it? We're going to spend the whole semester questioning everything here. The other character that you really need to know is Kurtz. And the thing is, you don't really know Kurtz because he never speaks directly to us. He says the horror the horror at one point, but that's filtered through Buddha Marlowe and young Marlowe. So ask that question about narrative frames and narrators in this novel in particular. So that's all I want to tell you about Heart of Darkness to warm you up to it. Watch the other videos, see if they're helpful for you. Uh, if they may not be, this may be all you need. Just finish the novel as we go along, but we're going to pick out passages throughout the semester. All right, let's get started with our first one.